So, a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good very early morning, I think, to some of you who I see joining us from the U.S. Um, very glad that you're able to, all of you, be here with us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anne Harrod Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, which is short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. And I am very pleased to be, once again, serving as co-host together with Melissa Patotti, Head of Policy at ICFA uh, for this event, which is third in the series, um, the Learning Stream series on humanitarian financing being jointly organized by ICFA and PHAP. Uh, today we'll be looking at the topic of pooled funding, and I'm very excited personally to see so many of you um, here for this discussion. I see there are now well over 100 people uh, with us in this um, large virtual room and really joining from all over the world. I also noticed uh, in the poll that we had open at the beginning uh, of the event uh, in the uh, in the waiting room, if you will, uh, it looked like the majority of you uh, do have some familiarity with the topic, but are really eager to learn more. So I'm really um, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you are all able to join us, and um, very much hope and expect that we'll be able to have a really practically uh, useful discussion uh, here today for all of you. Um, so I'd like to introduce Melissa uh, and uh, invite her to say a few words uh, here to start us off, and then we'll move into a few technical points before starting the session. Thank you, Anne Hurd. For those of you who don't know, ICFA is a network, an international network of NGOs that are dedicated to principled and effective humanitarian action, and many of us are trying to learn more about humanitarian financing. In our last two webinars, we focused on the overall humanitarian financing landscape, and then we also looked at humanitarian financing through partnerships between UN agencies and NGOs. Today's live learning session will focus on pooled funding mechanisms with a focus on country-based pooled funds, which some of us call CBPFs, and pooled funds managed by NGOs. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Melissa, and great to be um, co-hosting with you once again. Uh, so then, without further ado, we'll move into the topic for today's session. Um, we are looking today at uh, the topic of pooled funding, as mentioned. Uh, pooled funds have enabled more timely and flexible funding for responding to sudden crises and have made it possible to operate in otherwise underfunded emergency settings. Today, we're going to not only cover uh, OCHA as country-based pooled funds, which uh, will be referred to as the CBPFs, uh, but also funds led by NGOs such as the START Fund, which is providing a quick alternative avenue for NGOs to access timely humanitarian funding. I'll pass it over to, to Melissa if she'd like to add anything as we get going. You might remember if you participated in our first webinar on the humanitarian financing landscape that we talked about something called the SURF which is the Central Emergency Response Fund. That fund is managed by OCHA. It's a pooled funding mechanism that many NGOs can access, but only indirectly through partnerships with UN agencies. Since the SURF is not directly accessible to NGOs, um, for this webinar, we're focusing specifically on pooled funding sources that can be accessed directly by NGOs. Excellent. Thanks, Melissa. A very important um, point of clarification regarding the scope uh, of the discussion today. Um, so now I will uh, go through. We've identified four key learning objectives um, that we're committed uh, to trying to cover uh, with you today. So I'll just quickly go over those. So first objective is to build awareness of the different existing pooled funds and familiarity both with their purpose and, uh, and their origins, uh, which can be important. Uh, also for understanding uh, the dynamics and the possibilities for access um, on the part of NGOs. Second, uh, building understanding of how NGOs can access the main pooled financing mechanisms, uh, including the CBPFs, as mentioned, and NGO-led pooled funds. Third, awareness of the main challenges and opportunities for NGOs to access pooled funding. And finally, knowledge of the different sources of information uh, that you can go to on an ongoing basis regarding humanitarian pooled funding um, possibilities. And uh, Melissa, if you wouldn't mind perhaps introducing today's speakers. I'd be happy to. Uh, first, we want to introduce Fernando Hess. 
Uh, Fernando is currently participating in a webinar. It's very early in the morning for him, so we really appreciate it. He works with OCHA in New York in partnership and policy matters related to the OCHA managed country based pooled funds. He's worked with the UN since 1997. He's worked in contexts that are working humanitarian operations in Peru, Iraq, Sudan, South Sudan, Chad, Indonesia, and Egypt prior to transferring to the OCHA operations division at the headquarters. In 2014, he joined the funding coordination section, which oversees the global operations and management of CBPFs. He was instrumental in supporting the reconfiguration of the section following the introduction of major oversight and accountability frameworks. Currently, as the head of policy and partnerships unit in FCS, he has been working in the analysis and development of humanitarian financing policies and in enhancing partnerships with major CBPF stakeholders, including donors, but also NGOs. And that's how we got to know Fernando as an ICFA network. I'd also like to introduce Ben Garboot. He's a humanitarian funding advisor at Oxfam, an international NGO that is represented at the country-led pooled fund working group and co-chairs the NGO dialogue platform on country-based pooled funds. Before that, he was a regional funding coordinator for Oxfam as well, and ICFA Network is quite grateful to Oxfam for playing such an active role in trying to promote NGO understanding of country-based pooled funds. I'd also like to introduce Deepak, Deepak Sardiwal. Deepak currently works as a START Fund Officer for the START Network. Deepak has been in this role since September, and he works with members on a daily basis to provide a brokering service and drive the fund's decision-making processes within the 72-hour time frame. Previously, Deepak was a humanitarian analyst on the Global Humanitarian Assistance Program and led data analysis for the GHA report in 2015. And for those of you who are in our webinar the first time, uh, you heard a lot about the GHA report. I'd also like to introduce Reza Karim Chowdhury. Reza is the executive director of the Coastal Association for Social Transformation Trust, uh, otherwise known as COAST. He has expertise over many disciplines, such as promoting appropriate technology in the coastal belt, sustainable microfinance, advocacy, and policy influencing policy research and disaster management. He's going to share today with us his experience in accessing pooled funding uh, due to its current attendance in the COP22 in Marrakesh. Uh, we recorded his intervention. We'll be playing that together today with his presentation. And if you have specific questions directed for Reza, uh, we will try to facilitate those answers after the webinar. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. And we will get started now by giving the floor to you, Fernando. Great, thank you. So country-based pool funds are multi-donor humanitarian financing instruments established by the Emergency Relief Coordinator, which allow governments and private donors alike to pool their contributions to support specific emergencies. NGOs, UN agencies, and other humanitarian partners in the field have access to the pool funds in both sudden onset and prolonged uh, humanitarian situations. The unifying concept for country-based pool funds is that centralizing the fund resources and their allocation and that the leadership of the humanitarian coordinator on the ground brings the different aspects of the humanitarian response together in one channel. And with this, the main aim of the CBPFs, I would excuse if I use uh, Try not to, I will try not to use uh, uh, acronyms as much, but uh, as, as mentioned before, we, we will try to also refer to country-based pools as CBPFs. Uh, so the main aim of them focus on three outcomes. One is a strengthened leadership of the humanitarian coordinator. Two, more resources mobilized and better coordination of their use in support of the humanitarian planning framework. And three, funding priority humanitarian needs that are identified through an inclusive and participatory process that also involves national non-governmental organizations. The overall impact of CBPFs is therefore improved effectiveness of the humanitarian response, the provision of timely, coordinated, 
and principled assistance to save lives, alleviate suffering, and maintain human dignity. Country-based food funds are guided by the fundamental humanitarian principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. Building on those pillars, the principles of inclusiveness, flexibility, timeliness, and efficiency underpin how CBPF function and are demonstrated through the country-level process. On inclusiveness, the CBPFs are managed to include the national and international actors in meaningful ways, in governance and strategy, as well as possible funding. Flexibility refers to the recognition that the programmatic focus and funding priorities of CBPFs are set at the country level and may shift rapidly, especially in volatile humanitarian contexts. Timeliness of CBPS as response mechanisms follow their ability to allocate funds and save lives as humanitarian needs emerge or escalate. And finally, efficiency by which CBPS enable timely responses to prioritize humanitarian needs. Strategy and operation of country-based pool funds have adapted to align with the single approach to all forms of emergency response in the humanitarian program cycle. The humanitarian program cycle and the development of the country-specific humanitarian response plans, HRPs, under the leadership of the humanitarian coordinator on the ground, make it possible to quantify the needs in a coordinating, coordinated planning process. Uh, the pool funds operate within the coordination framework and are adaptable to meet changing conditions on the ground. And this slide represents uh, just a summary of the main actions that OCH is leading and uh, that are aligned with the World Humanitarian Summit and Grand Bargain commitments. So to promote a more predictable and accessible funding based for the delivery of HRPs, humanitarian response plans, and leverage the comparative advantages of local and national responders, the Secretary General Agenda for Humanity calls for increasing the overall portion of humanitarian appeal funding channel through CBPS to 15%. POCHA is committed to optimize the nimbleness and speed of CBPFs to enable a more effective humanitarian response and empower local and national NGO partners in the programming and delivery of assistance. This will require a concerted effort to diversify the donor base and reach out to new sources of funding. So now we come now to, that was a brief introduction to ongoing based pool funds, now coming more to the process for NGOs. And so which organizations are eligible to apply for country-based pool funds? So you may see it's all national and international NGOs, as well as the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and UN agencies. Uh, CBPFs are the largest source of direct funding for national and local NGOs. In 2015, CBPFs received almost 600 million in contributions, and 60% of the funding was allocated to NGOs, of which almost 20% went directly to national NGOs, about $85 million we're talking. And this is more than half of the total amount globally provided directly to national NGOs. So these active country-based pool funds are the mechanisms used to receive contributions from multiple financial partners and allocate such resources to multiple implementing entities to support specific priorities, as mentioned before, aligned with the humanitarian program cycle. In protracted crisis, CBPFs can also tackle interventions with a resilient approach, so long as these have been prioritized at the country level. So potential eligible partners can become CBPF implementing partners in the countries where CBPFs are in place, and which you can see in this um, slide. National NGOs and international NGOs can become implementing partners once they have been assessed for capacity and risk by the OCHA Humanitarian Financing Unit and meet the criteria assigned. CBPF required that NGOs go through a process to identify and analyze their capacity that allows to make an assessment about particular grant modalities that may be possible for the NGO. Through the capacity assessment process, OCHA aims to expand access to CBPFs to a broader variety of partners, as well as a way to reward good performance in grant management over time. Capacity assessments are carried out under the coordination of OCHA country offices and should take place before an application for funding is submitted. The assessment aims at determining 
whether an NGO has a sufficient level of capacity in terms of institutional, managerial, financial, and technical expertise. And eligible partners are then rated as either one high risk, two medium risk, or three low risk. The risk level determines the minimum control mechanisms applied throughout the grant management cycle. And this will determine uh, the level of disbursements, maximum amount of project proposals, the project duration, reporting requirements, and the monitoring that will be in place. So CBPs are the largest source of funding, direct funding for national and local NGOs, as I mentioned before. And this is the most recent uh, data from, for, well, in terms of the allocations that we've done this year, uh, as the date November, so just from uh, yesterday. A total 18 member states have pledged or contributed 549 million to the country-based pool funds in 2016. Uh, in turn, these funds have already disbursed 492 million to relief partners in 17 countries where they are operational. 46% of the funds have been allocated to international NGOs and some 18% to national NGOs. So now into additional information. Fernando, this is Melissa with ICFA. Uh, we just got a really good question, so I, I hope you don't mind if we can pause for a second. Um, with regard to your discussion on capacity assessments, which is a very important issue uh, that we've been talking about <clears throat> in a variety of fora, um, James Davies is asking about the capacity assessment. Why is it done at a country level? Uh, when, for example, international NGOs that have regional offices or headquarters offices outside of that particular country operation uh, might have some additional capacities elsewhere. Do you mind uh, answering that? Yeah, just uh, if I get a question correctly, it's related to having in-country specific uh, capacity assessments for those organizations that have already a global presence or, or or regional presence is that correct? Right, they might have capacity elsewhere that's supporting, um, as you were talking about, institutional capacity, managerial capacity, technical capacity. They might have some of that capacity outside of the country where the capacity is being assessed. Yeah, indeed. Um, right now, we are still doing it at at the, country, at the specific context, so each capacity assessment is at country level. Yes, so we had this discussion, for example, um, UN agencies are assessed at their organizational level at an international level, but NGOs are assessed at the country level. So could you explain why the score is only done at the country level for international and national NGOs? Yeah, with the issue comes, and we are aware of this difference, and uh, it's because of the being part of the, the UN system and having their own internal control systems. That's why the there is a difference, differential in the in the way we deal with capacity assessment between UN agencies and uh, NGOs. For the time being, we are doing a capacity assessment at the country level for all NGOs, regardless of their um, if they have already the presence in. We are trying to to look into this and see how we move forward. But currently, yes, we, this is part of the the, the accountability framework that we have, and uh, it's it's done this way yet. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. So, just in terms of additional information uh, available, one is related to the grant management system, the GMS, which is a standard platform for the management of all country-based pool funds. Uh, implementing partners use this interface to submit project proposals and reports, and OCHA coordinates project review, monitoring, and partner performance. The system captures evaluation results, tracks timelines, and promotes accountability in humanitarian response. OCHA maintains a system-wide overview of all funds, enabling support and coordination, and provides real-time fund information for stakeholders. As part of the GMS, uh, the business intelligence is a tool that displays the data in meaningful and useful structure, which helps users to analyze the ongoing business process with a consolidated view. And I would invite you to to go to, to the GMS and then go into the business intelligence section and, and really see the, the latest data. It's a real-time data 
that you will be able to see on 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 the overall uh, uh, country based pool funds and finally also just to touch upon the CBPF global guidelines which are the set of documents that outline the principles objectives and functioning of CBPFs and which were approved in in January 2015 and since that we are really been making great strides in improving the the operation of, of CBPFs worldwide and they include this these guidelines include one the policy instruction which provides an overview of the principles, objectives, governance, and management arrangements for CBPFs, and then also the operational handbook that provides a complete set of technical guidelines, tools, and templates using the management of CBPFs. The global guidelines are mandatory for all CBPFs. The operational guidance contained in the handbook represents minimum standards for management arrangement that must apply to all CBPFs. Each country-based pool fund will develop country-specific operational manuals based on the operational handbook. So, but there are many, the minimum standard will be these this, this, uh, guidelines which uh, are used at the global level, and you can check them also on our, on our website. Uh, they are there. We can send them to you if you require. And so I would, I think I will leave it there for the time being, and uh, then look forward for the questions later. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, and we do have several more questions coming in, but I think we'll uh, be better off saving them uh, for the end, as you say, and we'll move now uh, directly into the presentation from Ben Garbutt uh, coming to us from Oxfam. Great to have you here, Ben. We will hand the floor over to you. Thanks very much, Ang Harrod, and thank you to uh, Melissa as well. Thanks, PHAP, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I assume since no one's interrupting me, uh, you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, and it's great to be following Fernando, with, uh, with whom uh, we work so closely. Um, so thanks for your presentation, Fernando. And wonderful, if I might add, to see so many people here, some that I recognize, um, and uh, more than 140 participants, which leaves me feeling slightly overawed, um, because I know that there's so much experience in the room. So, uh, But also leaves me looking forward to a good interaction with you as well. So. Uh, I've only been given uh, five to ten minutes on this, and I have a lot to run through, uh, and I'm already taking up my own time, so let's skip on then. I've been asked to speak to you about four things. Uh, firstly, the benefits of accessing CBPFs. Secondly, the challenges to accessing, and some of the recent improvements uh, in accessing CBPFs. Uh, that's where I'm going to spend most of my time on that second aspect. Thirdly, I'm going to give you uh, just one or two very quick helpful tips in accessing CBPFs. And uh, since I'm here and I'm taking advantage of squeezing in a short advert uh, about the NGO dialogue platform on pool funds, which uh, is actually related to what I'm talking about. So uh, don't worry about that. So let me move on quickly. Uh, the benefits of accessing CVPS. I'm going to skip through this quite quickly because Fernando's already spoken quite a lot about this. Uh, I've got three areas. Um, firstly, uh, let's remember that donor contributions to CVPS are unearmarked, um, which is, of course, one of the, the commitments within the, the grand bargain for donors. So uh, local advisory boards and the whole of the CVPF uh, framework and structure should ensure that the funding is sent to the most under-resourced and priority areas in a response. Of course, it's related to the humanitarian response plan as well. Um, so it should be, uh, should be done in that manner. Leading to the second point, um, which is that the CBPF should introduce an element of coordination and efficiency. Um, so the, the, the improved coordination should, should, should facilitate an inclusive uh, an efficient humanitarian response on the ground. That's the theory. No one's claiming that it happens systematically, of course, um, but I think that CBPS and their relationship to the HRPs um, does help the overall coordination and efficiency of the response. Uh, and thirdly, and uh, I've seen, uh, you, you feel free if you have a different experience of this to shoot me down on this one, but um, uh, there is an element in which, in which we, you could argue that the CBPS are administratively light. There's these new global guidelines that were introduced last year, 
um, and they aim to ensure that CBPFs are um, not as administratively heavy as they might have been in the past, um, especially in comparison with other donors perhaps. And again, I'm not, I'm not claiming that in all cases CBPS are administratively light, but I think there have been great steps taken through the introduction and uh, following the global guidelines to ensure uh, that administration levels are, are reduced for those who are accessing CBPS. So here's where I'm going to spend most of my time on challenging challenges to accessing uh, and some of the recent improvements uh, to CBPS. And I'm going to start off uh, with that, with that uh, comment or that topic of access, uh, and Fernando's already, uh, we've already had a question on this, but one topic that's really dominated some of the strategic discussions uh, about CBPFs has been the partner capacity assessments. Let me talk about some of the main challenges uh, in bullet point form. So, so some of the challenges that NGOs have faced include timing uh, in deadline setting, uh, in short turnaround times and receipt of guidance on the PCA process. There have been issues of engagement related to the sharing of results, um, and at times uh, NGOs have been uh, have, have felt that the feedback on the processes have been weak. Sometimes there have been technical issues with the online system or language barriers. But most importantly, there's also some uh, you know a frequent uh, let's say challenge that we face is a large volume of documents and procedures that's required uh, during the PCA process. Um, sometimes, although NGOs are producing this documentation, it's the, the useful no, usefulness of it uh, isn't necessarily clear. So, so those are some of the challenges. Uh, what improvements have we seen? Well, the approach to PCAs included in the new guidelines aims to minimize uh, any unnecessary burden. Of course, there is an element of flexibility within it, the PCA process, so each country can do it in a different, different way. And I thought I would add a little color in terms of improvements and in, um, in, in, in terms of giving you some uh, experience and examples from the field. So we had a program manager um, from Yemen praising Ocha for uh, promoting a str an open door strategy to reach out to local uh, and national partners in recognition that some of the national partners might have difficulty in submitting the PCA process and, and, and passing, the pro passing that process. So, um, in doing that, Ocha were obviously looking for more national partners, were able to discuss with local and international NGOs how to improve access for local and national partners uh, by ensuring that they can pass the PCA process. So there's some proactive work being done by Ocha in countries to ensure that, that, that uh, partners can access uh, or can, can pass the PCA process. We've also had uh, experience from a Syrian uh, civil society organization uh, praising the process um, in, uh, in saying that it gave them an opportunity to gain knowledge on minimum standards on regulations, uh, human resource policies, financial systems, etc., especially given the fact that uh, some of the civil society organizations in that country are relatively new uh, relative to, to some other international NGOs, and therefore that PCA process gave them that knowledge and understanding. So there are, I, I'm not, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture for you. There are some difficulties with the process. There are some improvements, uh, and clearly there are all, obviously some improvements still to be made as well. The next uh, issue I'd like to raise is about speed. Uh, and uh, I'm going to rush on a little bit because I'm taking up too much time talking of speed. So some of the challenges that NGOs have faced in speed uh, are mainly in two places how quickly applications uh, are processed, and how quickly funds are dispersed. That's not to say there aren't speed issues elsewhere in terms of how quickly a call for proposals might be put out, for example, just that those are the main two areas. Now, some of the improvements, OCHA have actually committed to some speed-related targets. So there's a target now of 50 days as the average number of days for processing uh, applications for sudden and unforeseen emergencies. There's also a target of 85% in terms of the percentage of disbursements from CBPFs to implementing partners made within 10 days. So um, whether you agree whether those targets are sufficient or not, there's some definite progress in, in, in introducing those targets. Um, I'm not entirely sure how well OCHA have uh, attained those targets yet. I don't know if Fernando has those, fingers at, has those, uh, those uh, figures at his fingertips, but he might be able to update us later, perhaps. Moving on, uh, flexibility. 
uh, of the country-based pool funds. We've had, again, we've had two types of challenges on this. The first is in backdating, um, and this is because grant agreements couldn't be backdated. There were delays in process uh, and, and often cited in, uh, as being detrimental in reducing the time uh, within which an NGO can implement a project. And the new guidelines partly address this challenge. So for the time being, backdating still isn't possible, but implementing partners can suggest a project start date which is different from the agreement date, it, it, just in case they need to wait uh, for the first disbursement in able, to enable them to start a project. So some progress, um, but we could make more progress, obviously. The second challenge on flexibility has been in terms of changes to the project. So changes of more than 15% uh, to a project budget require the, the HC's approval. Um, so that can take a little bit of time. Uh, the new guidelines, again, partly address this challenge. So there's a clearer budget structure and template which uh, aims to ensure that implementing partners reduce, in principle, the likeliness of variations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that requirement for HD's approval still isn't uh, reduced. So, but minor progress uh, within the new guidelines, uh, which we can seek to, to build on. I'm whizzing through this. I hope you're all still with me. Uh, some quick top tips for you uh, in accessing uh, CBPS, and these are very quick, so bear with me. The first is to uh, engage. It, it sounds very simple, I know. Um, engage with your local OCHA team and with the cluster mechanism, but you would be very surprised at how often I find complaints that there um, being something wrong with a CBPF uh, mechanism without there having been a dialogue in country about it. I would say don't limit yourselves to simply trying to access the cash. For example, what seats are available on the advisory board at a local level? Or what access do you have to those who are on the advisory board? Or how often are you communi communicating your program requirements uh, to OCHA or, or others through the cluster system? The second is to empower yourself. Uh, I've talked about it uh, several times and uh, as Fernando earlier, but you can empower yourself by reading and understanding the global guidelines. It's the single most important document you can read to understand country-based pool funds. And if you're seeking to engage, why haven't you read it and understood it? And the third is to elevate. So if there is an issue or, an, or a problem that needs to be sorted that you're finding uh, isn't sorted in country, at country level, there are options for you uh, to elevate that issue uh, to an above country level as well. So that brings me very neatly on to my quick advert about the NGO Dialogue platform on pooled funds. I have a question, I think. Yes, Ben, uh, we have some very relevant questions to your slide that you just had <clears throat> about engaging. Mm -hmm. um, we have received some questions from people who have challenges um, in terms of access, for example, with the partner capacity assessment, um, in terms of uh, heavy administrative processes, uh, you had mentioned earlier the focus on getting light processes, and uh, we also had questions, for example, from Amwengwe and the DRC and Anita in Uganda about to what extent uh, national and local NGOs can be in involved in decision-making processes uh, affecting allocation decisions. Um, where should these issues be taken up? Because you have just mentioned uh, engaging at the country level, um, and uh, and uh, you, you mentioned escalating or elevating. Could you uh, yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, at a country level, uh, there are uh, NGO representatives on the advisory board. Uh, you should be able to find out who they are. OCHA will be able to tell you in country, and you can uh, elevate your issue by going through them. If you're finding that, uh, for example, you think the processes that are outlined in the, in the global guidelines aren't being followed, or you're finding some deviation, you can go through the advisory board to do that. Uh, it, transparency actually is an issue um, that, that I didn't raise, uh, the transparency of process. Uh, and it's often one that, that rears its head as well. Um, the, the global guidelines, again, are very clear. Um, they, they lay out very clearly allocation mechanisms. And actually, you can see the word transparency literally written all over um, that section on allocation mechanisms. So if you find 
um, that 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 your your that isn't being stuck to. You can seek recourse, recourse through the local advisory board, or if you're finding uh, this a uh, consistent problem that isn't being uh, isn't being addressed, or a consistent problem in more than one country, you can come through uh, the the NGO dialog platform on country-based pool funds, which actually leads me into this section. So, is, if that's okay, I'll move on, Melissa. Yes, please. It's quite relevant. Yeah. So, um, so the NGO dialogue platform on pooled funds. I'm going to give you a what is it, uh, who's invited, and uh, when does it happen. So, what is it? It was essentially created uh, so that OCHA can have an opportunity to connect and, and share feedback about global level changes within uh, within trend and trends about country-based pooled funds, and so that NGOs have the opportunity to offer feedback. So you can see here, it's an internal forum for regular dialogue between OCHA and NGOs about CBPFs. So this is a place to, to which you can go to elevate uh, any issues or challenges, uh, operational challenges, policy level challenges uh, that you have with country-based pool funds. So uh, who is it? Uh, the membership of that platform is open to all NGOs. That includes international, local, and national NGOs. Um, obviously, the purpose is to have a, a meaningful dialogue, so we ask that NGO representatives have relevant expertise, uh, and as you can see in the third bullet point there, national NGOs with, with direct experience of country-based pool funds are really encouraged, and, and we can try to facilitate uh, participation uh, through, the, through, through this platform. Uh, when is it? So, uh, it's, uh, we have meetings twice a year. Um, and we've now introduced webinars and learning events, ad hoc webinars and learning events uh, uh, as we go along as well on an ad hoc basis. So we're really excited that the next meeting actually is the first time it's going to be taken out of either New York or Geneva as a location. Uh, and, and I think it's about time that we discussed operational and strategic issues of CBPFs uh, in an area where there are actually CBPFs. So the next meeting you'll see there is in Nairobi on the 2nd of December. Um, and there's a webinar. I've got this date wrong. You know, I've got I've got a week ahead of myself. There's a webinar actually today on the 10th of November, uh, later on, uh, on fin the financial guidelines for CBPF. So an opportunity to uh, educate yourselves about the financial guidelines. So um, if you want to join, and I can't believe I didn't put this on the slide. Uh, you can actually write to uh, an email address, which I'm going to put in the chat box, or I think Maya's probably online as well, and she can write this in the chat box. Uh, you can write to this uh, email address, uh, and eventually you'll join the, the email group, and you'll be sent details of the next meetings. You'll be asked for opportunities to input into the agenda, and of course you'll be given uh, all the links and details about how to join the webinars as well. So. Uh, I can't see my writing, so I'm going to write it in the chat box. In fact, that's probably, that is the end of my presentation there, and I'm going to give you the email address of the country-based pooled fund uh, NGO dialogue platform uh, within the chat box. So I'll finish up there, Melissa. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ben, uh, for the presentation. Inspired a lot of uh, a lot of discussion, and as you heard, a lot of questions. Um, so thanks so much for for sharing with us. We're going to move uh, right along now to welcome Deepak uh, to the floor. Deepak here um, from the Start Fund, an initiative under the Start Network. <clears throat> it's an absolute pleasure to to be here presenting on the Start Fund um, at this webinar, and great to see so many people tuning in online. Um, before I delve into the details of the Start Fund, I just wanted to provide some context um, before doing that. So we know that civil society is responsible for the majority of frontline work during humanitarian emergencies. However, NGOs are constrained by a funding model where it's often difficult for them to respond until an emergency has escalated and attracted media headlines. So in this reactive model, lives are lost, livelihoods are destroyed, and hard-won development gains are undermined even before a response is launched. So where does the Start Fund fit into this? The Start Fund is a multi-donor pooled rapid response fund that allocates pre-positioned humanitarian funding within 72 hours, um, and these are for 45-day um, projects. 
We have currently four donors providing funding for this, um, DFID, Irish Aid, the Netherlands, and most recently ECHO for an anticipation window, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And these donors have delegated authority to the START network members to make decisions collectively on how the fund is used. A distinctive feature of the START fund is that it is collectively owned and managed by the 42 NGOs that make up the network. And you saw on my, my first slide um, those, those 42 um, NGOs. These are a mix of international and increasingly national and regional um, NGOs. Um, the second part of my slide, please. So the, the START Fund is designed to enable these NGOs and their partners to respond early and fast to three types of emergencies that you see um, on your screen. Underfunded small to medium scale emergencies that often receive little funding, um, spikes in chronic humanitarian emergencies is all too often these situations do not receive attention or funding until many knives have already been lost. Um, and the third type of crisis is um, or area is forecast of impending emergency. So this talks to the anticipation window, which aims to release funding in response to signals of a looming emergency to allow agencies to prepare and respond before the emergency hits. So this is very much a change to the traditional model of humanitarian response, which is reactive rather than proactive, where something bad must happen before resources are mobilized. This slide here just gives you a very quick overview of the history of the START Fund, um, which falls under the START network, um, set up in 2010, the network. For those of you who have followed the journey, our journey um, may remember that we were previously called the Consortium of British Humanitarian um, agencies, um, and this was renamed to the START Network in 2012. The START Fund was officially launched in 2014, and by October 2015, um, £10 million had been awarded through the START Fund. Um, and in August this year, um, the START Fund responded to its 100th emergency, um, and this month, three new members have joined. Um, that's 50 new members this year, taking the total membership to 42. Um, next slide, please. So how does it all work? This slide tries to show you the different points START Network members and their partners um, participate in the START Fund. So any member of the network can alert the fund to an emergency, either a looming one or one that is in motion. Um, this is two um, alert that's being highlighted for you there. Thank you very much. Um, and when this happens, um, within 24 hours, a decision is made by the Start Network members on whether to provide funds to the emergency, um, and if so, how much. That's the allocation um, number three that you see on the slide. Um, if an emergency is to receive funding, members are given 24 hours to submit project proposals. Um, and these are reviewed by members in country um, and successful projects are awarded funds. Um, and from a member alerting the network to an emergency, um, to an emergency to the award of funds, this all happens in 72 hours. And that may explain some of the gray hair on, on me, which of course you can't see right now. And then after, um, after that, the projects are implemented within 45 days. Um, and then afterwards, members come together to reflect on the response and identify actionable learning um, to take forward. So it's this ability of the fund to respond early and quickly to the three types of emergencies I mentioned earlier that provides its niche. Um, and while there are other funds available um, to NGOs which are complementary, of course, many of these operate um, through longer time horizons. So key facts and figures um, of the START Fund so far. So since April 2014, the START Fund has responded to 128 alerts. Um, 84 of those, or about two thirds, have received funding. Um, and this has reached nearly 5 million people in 46 countries. Um, and almost 19 million now has been um, dispersed from the fund. 
So just very quickly touching on some of the main start fund principles, um, collaboration, decentralization, and diversity. So I'll start uh, with collaboration um, on the next slide, please. So we very much believe that as a network, we can achieve more together, more together um, than any single organization acting alone could accomplish. Um, and we provide platforms to enable collaborative approaches. So collaboration in terms of making decisions. So it's the start network members that participate in the allocation and project selection meetings to make joint decisions. So in those allocation meetings, a decision is made on whether to provide funding to an emergency. And in those project selection meetings, um, decisions are taken on which projects to, to fund. Um, and when the fund is alerted to an emergency, um, there is an online survey where every member has the opportunity to indicate whether or not they support um, allocation of funds to an emergency um, and also the appropriate funding amount. So they're, so they're all contributing to the decisions that are made for each emergency. Um, and then very quickly on um, collaboration to share information, uh, we have um, an opportunity for members to discuss and share information over Skype about possible alerts um, to be alerted to, to the fund. In the interest of time, I, I'll, I'll move on to, to the next slide and talk about diversity and decentralization. So we recognize that organizations come in different sizes and types, and we very much view that as an opportunity, not as a barrier. Um, and we have a total now of um, 42 network members across five continents, and that includes several national NGOs working in countries where humanitarian emergencies take place, such as Palestine, Bangladesh, Mexico, Jordan, and so forth. Um, the um, START Fund um, is is managed by a, a committee who provides strategic oversight of the fund and we have a quarter representation from from outside of Europe on that committee and I'll speak to that point a little bit later on in my presentation. Um, moving on to decentralization um, and our focus on shifting decision making to the places where um, emergencies happen, um, the decisions on which projects the fund are made in the affected country. Um, and the Start Fund has also um, established um, standing decision making groups. You saw that on the timeline, perhaps, that I, I gave earlier, um, which is made up of members and partners in country, um, in countries where we have a high number of alerts or believe there should be a high number of alerts um, that have been trained on the Start Fund process um, and that can be quickly mobilized to select projects if an emergency is raised in, in that country. Um, and we currently have those groups for 10 countries. Looking then on some possible areas of improvement, some of the challenges that we've experienced. Um, first of all, most um, start network members are still based in Europe, um, despite that quarter representation on the committee that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we're very much exploring ways to um, involve local and national partners more in our process. Um, and we're, we're currently undertaking a review on that um, to help us with it. Um, second area of improvement or challenge or issue I wanted to quickly highlight is that we've seen a huge increase in, the, in demand for the start fund. Um, so we've had as many emergencies um, being alerted to the fund this year as 2014 and 15 combined. Um, and in 2016, so far, um, there has been an alert, an emergency to the start fund every 4.9 days on average. Um, and the amount awarded per month um, this year is also up by over a quarter compared to last year. Um, so this, of course, requires additional mobilization of not just financial resources, but, but also human resources. Um, Great, so this slide here on how to access the Start Fund, I'm sure many of you are, are, are keen on, on, on this particular slide. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that NGOs don't need to be a member to access the Start Fund. They can do this through any of the 42 members of the Start Network as a partner. Um, and while the long-term ambition remains to grow the size of the network, 
and we're currently holding off on increasing membership um, for now. So this year we've seen the membership increase very rapidly from 27 members to 42 and we're at a point of consolidation and ensuring existing members are fully contributing um, to the network um, and also um, trying to mobilize more resources which can, which can then be spread over more members. Um, but there are opportunities, or there will be opportunities, so if you are interested in working with the START Network or applying for membership potentially in the future, um, my colleague Jem would be very happy to hear from you, um, and his email address is, is there. Um, next slide. Oh, question. Yes, please. Yes, Deepak, <clears throat> wanted to ask you uh, some questions we heard, uh, for example, from Rima in Jordan. Uh, we just heard a presentation from Fernando and from Ben about country-based pooled funds managed by um, UN OCHA, and then we've heard your presentation about the START network, which is really driven by NGOs. Uh, so Rima in Jordan is asking, could you identify some of the main differences between pooled funds managed by the UN uh, versus those led by the NGOs? And secondly, Ian from the UK is asking, um, you, you mentioned a lot about emergency response. Is there an ability um, for NGOs to access funding to invest in organizational capacity, or is it more about uh, the response? Yes, um, fantastic questions. Thank you very much um, for those. Um, the Start Fund is, I'll, I'll tackle the second one first. The Start Fund is, is largely focusing on providing rapid and early um, financing to humanitarian emergencies. But we do have other work streams within the Start Network, which I didn't mention, um, including um, Start Response, Start Labs, and particularly Start Engage, um, which is a program that tries to unlock new approaches to crisis preparedness and response. Um, that looks to um, build the capacity of members and partners to respond to humanitarian emergencies. So it's very much something that's covered within um, the wider work of, of the network, um, but perhaps not necessarily the start fund. Um, in terms of the first question, um, I think that's not just a uh, a question to, to, to me, but for others and, and members also who have experienced perhaps working with, with both funds to, to come in here. Um, I would turn back to the kind of key distinctions of the Start Fund and, and how it's managed and owned by the NGOs themselves. Um, so it's, it's them who are making the decisions collectively on whether um, emergencies should be responded to by the start fund and which projects should be funded. Um, so that ownership is, is very much with the NGOs um, through a trust-based uh, peer review system. Um, so uh, I would like to probably highlight that in the context of, of the start fund and perhaps differences with other approaches. Um, is that all right in terms of, yes, yes thanks, seems to be. Please proceed. Yes, Thank great. You. Um, so this, if I remember correctly, might be the last slide. So just to say, if you want any more information, um, the START Network website is a fantastic resource. Um, there you will have a START Fund page with a START Fund induction pack and a practical guide, um, and also our annual report um, as well. Um, and of course, I, I briefly touched upon our other work streams, um, Start Engage, Start Labs, Start Response. Um, more information on, on those work streams is available on the website. Um, specifically on the Start Fund, you can contact us um, at that email address, startfund at startnetwork.org. Um, and again, that's the email address of Jim, my colleague, to um, discuss possibilities to work with the, the network and and to become a member in the future. That, I believe, brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening, and I, I look forward to um, answering any questions people may have.
Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Deepak. Very much appreciated. And uh, indeed, we have a lot of questions and hope that we will have time uh, at the end here uh, to address a few more of those. And I'll also mention regarding the questions, since we know that there is a lot of um, a lot of interest, there are a lot of pending and, and, and in some cases very practical uh, questions for follow-up. Uh, we will not, we already know, we will not be able to get to all of them uh, during the actual live session today. Day. However, uh, we will be doing our best um, together with the, the help and, and uh, generosity of our, um, of our speakers, our experts uh, who are with us today, to try and follow up uh, as much as possible on questions uh, in writing so that those can be available to you um, as a resource uh, after this session as well. Um, so now for our final presentation, as Melissa had mentioned at the um, uh, we have a presentation from Reza Chaudhary. He's not able to be with us uh, actually live in person, but we um, are fortunate to have had a chance to record a presentation with him. Um, so we'll share that with you now, and uh, uh, we have both the audio and we have a, a few slides uh, as well to go along with his presentation. And as Melissa mentioned, um, do feel free as well if you have questions that you would like us to direct to Reza. We'll be very happy to do that, and uh, although, of course, he won't be able to answer them now because he's um, uh, in another meeting, we'll follow up with him and, and uh, ask him to respond in writing afterwards. Um, so now we can cue that recording. Yeah, my name is Reza. I'm working for a COAST. Uh, COAST is an organization working for coastal poor in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we are part of a pool fund which is uh, managed by an uh, intermediary organization. The, m most of the fund is coming from UK aid and a small portion from, from, from World Bank and NORAD and CEDA. This is related to, 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 to governance, advocacy, raising boys, and, 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 and organizing peoples. And also, we are also part of uh, pool funds being managed by another one in intermediary organizations uh, in respect of climate uh, adaptation fund, spatial fund, where we are part for last 13 years. <clears throat> So, in the beginning, selected us uh, in a very participatory way, in a very rigorous process of assessment on accounts, number one, and the governance. In respect of governance, this is transparency, participation, no conflict of interest. Even apart from that, uh, by monthly basis, from the pool fund mechanism management, uh, there is a rigorous assessment of on accounting, standard maintenance, governance, and also uh, a quarterly basis uh, monitoring in, in impact level. And six monthly, there are uh, external evaluations and annual external evaluations from the intermediary bodies and uh, every two years uh, there are joint evaluation from 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 donors and intermediary bodies so what I have the experience in respect of food funding if it is for the local NGOs and national NGOs you have to be you have to be acquainted to maintain the accounting standard in view of the international standard. Number two, you have to integrate uh, accountability, transparency, participation, no conflict of interest in your governance. Number three, you have to be very creative in respect of showing impact in the, in the, in the, in the beneficiary level. So these are the three exp three expertise or three skill know-hows have to be with the local NGOs if they want to be part of uh, full funding. Mm -hmm. So because at the end of the day, who will give the money, whether it is UK or Danida, 
they have some accountability to their taxpayers, to their own own government government systems. So these are my experience uh, in respect of pool funding in 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 Bangladesh. In my experience, it was a trial and error process of developing our accounting standard, number one. It was a trial and error process of developing management standard, number two. And sometimes we feel that accounting and management, it's a very static thing. I don't think so. It's a very dynamic. Uh, it's a matter of creativity especially in respect of governance when you how you are reporting how you are accountable and nowadays accountability is not only to the upper level it is also accountability to your peer level accountability toward your beneficiaries how you are integrating the opinions of the poor people beneficiaries humanitarian victims in your decision making how you are shifting powers so these this, this we have learned from our pool funding mechanism. It's a matter of how you are mitigating conflict of interest and how you are transparent and, and how you are maintaining the international standard and how you are keeping your things are free from fraudulence and others. So these are these are these we have learned and we are still learning. So now one of the tendency among the NGOs and donors, they don't pay the overhead cost. We are, uh, we are maintaining around, uh, say, say, around 20 projects. But I can tell you, at least in 15 projects, the donor don't give money for us, overhead, for central office expenditure. But you can ask us, why you do it? Because as this is a matter for our people in the coastal area in our area we would do it but maintaining we are always in tensions whether there is a flaws in the accounting whether there is in flaws in uh, in governance i am part of a pool funding mechanism where i am getting funding uk funding for more than last 15 years in the sector of human rights and governance there is a separate uh, stop for accounts, for audit, for monitoring, very capable stop, highly paid stop, and it's running well. So for full funding, there must be other the organization. In one side, either the organization has proven track record of strong management culture. Number one, or you have to go for a separate management. Otherwise, you'll face problem. Because it's true, even I give money to my, my children, they have to be accountable to me. The donors who is giving money to the, in full funding, they have their own accountability. Okay, excellent. So we have... Uh just been hearing a recorded presentation from Reza Chaudhary, who's the executive director of the Coastal Association for Social Transformation Trust, known as COAST, in Bangladesh. So that brings us now to the, the end of our presentations for um, this learning session. So we'll move right ahead into the Q&A. I'll be giving the floor to, uh, to Melissa to pose a number of the questions that have come through during the presentations and also uh, some even in advance of the session and before doing that uh, just wanted to note for our speakers who are with us live today uh, as we draw the event uh, to a close in, a, in about 20 minutes from now uh, I will go around one more time if you have any uh, closing thoughts advice uh, other points that you would like to leave with the with the group so just a, a heads up about that but now I'll give the um, the floor over to Melissa for uh, Q&A Thank you so much. Uh, the first round of questions are for Fernando. Fernando, are you ready? Uh, first, uh, Sebastian in Belgium is asking, uh, what is the criteria used to establish a pool fund in a country location? Um, second, Gohar in Pakistan asked, 
whether the pooled funds are based on the humanitarian response plan or the humanitarian needs overview. So if you could elaborate on their connection to the HRP and the HNOs, that would be helpful. And thirdly, Orla of Ireland uh, was mentioning um, some experience that uh, NGOs have had when looking at different approaches used at the country levels for due diligence. Um, for example, in some locations, it seems that organizations can apply for a CBPF and then they complete the due diligence process, while in other location it seems the due diligence process has, happens first before you can apply. And I think that's what you had mentioned in the, in the guidelines. So the question uh, asked is, are um, the global guidelines supposed to be applied consistently across all countries? And how can we get some more information on the due diligence procedures that are meant to be applied? So those are the three um, first questions we'll um, ask your advice on, Fernando. Thank you. The first question you were raising, Melissa, it's related to the criteria used to establish a country-based proof on a specific location. Indeed, um, there are some criteria, um, and one of them is that the most important probably is that there is, a, in fact, donor interest to pull resources into uh, these kind of mechanisms. So first, uh, that's, that's a major issue. And then also that there has to be an OCHA presence and location of an OCHA office through which we were able to really uh, manage the fund. So those are the two main issues that really uh, drive uh, decisions on how if we will be establishing um, a new uh, CBPF in place. The other question that you were asking was related to coming from Pakistan, I think the, okay, the reconnection to the HRPs or HNOs, so when asking. Indeed, as part of the uh, reform we made with the guidelines in two years ago, now it will be at the beginning in January 2015, was that uh, the CBPFs, yes, indeed are aligned to the HRPs in country. So, uh, Usually, ideally, they are, the prioritization process is done, of course, in alignment with the HRP once the allocation process is, is uh, discussed and uh, approved at the country level. So it's very important to remember, I've seen a lot of questions coming also through the window in the chat, that it's a very decentralized process and all the decision making takes at the country level. Um, and finally, the other question you were raising was related to some experiences of different approaches to due diligence. That's, uh, no, we have a standard approach to the due diligence and there's no way that any NGO can apply before the due diligence has taken place, even though, even, even this, if you try to enter into the GMS data, that will not be, we will not be allowed. So, um, that, that's a little bit thing. And, Indeed, the global guidelines are the minimum standards, as I was saying in the presentation that we have. So there may be additional uh, processes or requirements that are made at the country level. And this is very context specific. Um, but uh, for the, even the capacity assessment, it's, it's a standard procedure. What they will change is usually very specific questions related to the context, but the categories that we have included are the same everywhere. So we are really trying to keep a very standardized process all, all together. But as I said, there is there may be slight differences in from one country to another. But these are the minimum standards in the guidelines, so you can go through them. And one other thing I think I've heard and probably good news is like we will embark next year into a process of revision of the guidelines. So for that, we of course, we will be consulting um, all our stakeholders and uh, NGOs, of course, are very important for us to hear them, their concerns and their experiences so far and see how and what we need to really look into. So we will be engaging through the CBPF NGO dialogue platform to which uh, Ben had referred before as well to, to embark in that process by next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando. I'd like to turn now to Deepak uh, from the Start Network perspective. 
uh, we've seen that one of the key comparative advantages of the um, pooled funding that the Start Network manages is the issue of speed, that you can quickly make decisions to allocate in response to emergencies. You even said every four or so days you get a new alert. Anita of Uganda was asking, have you done an analysis on whether the Start Fund has demonstrated any improved response? due to NGOs being able to access funding early in the phase? Thank you. Great, fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you for the, the question. So um, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, after each um, start fund response, there is um, a learning exchange um, where um, agencies come together to reflect on the response. And what we've repeatedly seen um, in those meetings is agencies um, reflecting that they would not have been able to respond when they did if it had not been for the start fund. Um, and we know that the period immediately after an emergency has occurred is when most lives are saved. Um, so that, that real kind of reality does hit home in the conversations we have with members during those learning um, exchange meetings. Um, and this was um, seen in particular for the Burundi um, regional crisis um, where that came out. Also something I didn't mention in my presentation is that start fund projects are meant to be flexible. Um, so they can be adapted according to rapidly changing circumstances. Um, and also in those learning meetings, agencies have really valued that because it's enabled them to provide the most appropriate response according to the needs of the affected population on the ground. Um, so just bringing that extra dimension there of the flexibility of start fund projects as well as its timeliness and that is leading to um, more effective um, humanitarian responses. Thank you very much Deepak. <clears throat> the next batch of questions I'd like to hear from Ben and also Fernando and I'm grouping them because uh, they're very connected to the grand bargain on humanitarian financing. The grand bargain is trying to accomplish many things uh, and the first is this issue of um, trying to support national and local responders um, with more direct funding but also capacity strengthening. Um, so Mohammed, who's um, writing us in from Somalia, He's asking, are there measures being taken to improve the share or the proportion of pooled funding that goes directly to local and national NGOs so that there's more of a balance between funding that goes directly to UN uh, agencies and INGOs? Um, and secondly, he asked about capacity assessments, um, really locking out local NGOs and wanted to hear more about what can be done to strengthen capacity. And this is one of the commitments in the grand bargain is to really invest in capacity of national and local frontline responders. And the second part of uh, the questions we received that really relate to the grand bargain is this whole notion of reducing burdensome donor conditions. So Frederick of CARE is asking um, <clears throat> about uh, simplifying and harmonizing uh, agreements. So if the global guidelines on country-based pooled funds are to be streamlined, simplified, um, as per the grand bargain so that they're more accessible, uh, what is being done in that regard? Over to you. Would you like to start, Ben? Yeah, sure. Um, support to national and local responders, first of all. Uh, I I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the figures, I get the figures mixed up, but off the top of my head, I think uh, OCHA have, uh, I'm, I'm sure Fernando will be able to tell you, but OCHA have a target of how much uh, of the country-based pool funds will be going directly to national and local responders. I get the figures mixed up because they're slightly different for the Charter for Change and OCHA's national, uh, and OCHA's figure, something, somewhere between 20 and 25%. Um, and the year-on-year -year increase uh, has shown that it's possible to reach that figure. Um, because because it is increasing the, the proportion that goes to national and local responders. Uh, investing in the capacity of local partners, well I get already in my in my uh, presentation I gave you the example of Yemen and Syria where OCHA are proactively going out and uh, seeking to engage local and national partners uh, and advise them and support them in undertaking and passing the partner capacity assessment process which, as you can tell from the example Syria, gave them, um, gave them an under gave those local and national partners who perhaps didn't have the capacity in the first place an understanding of what was required and helped them build towards that. 
Now, I'm not saying that that happens in every single OCHA country office. And actually, um, you know, I'm not I'm not a spokesperson for OCHA, obviously, but that there's been I, I've seen some some poor examples of that in OCHA country offices where um, the, the the country office actually won't support local or don't encourage uh, local and national NGOs to to apply. So the, the, it, there's, a, there's a mixed bag there. Um, but I think uh, if we follow the examples of Yemen and Syria in particular, um, where OCHA is, is reaching out and trying to ensure that local and national partners pass the capacity assessment process, then that's the best way to go, obviously. Um, what was the last one, Melissa? Um, I was also asking about uh, reduced donor conditions. Reduced donor conditions. Gosh, I don't know if I'll be able to answer that one because that's going to obviously that's going to require um, the donors to get together, not just uh, you know Ocha are. Uh, well, let, let's put it this way: the the uh, global guidelines um, I think that I've been talking about and Fernando's been talking about a lot um, are a great framework. But there's flexibility within that framework, which is why we've seen some of the questions today and some of the examples that I've given you um, show that there is a difference in how those guidelines are applied at country level. So we, uh, some people see, see that as inconsistency, but I think if you look at the guidelines, you have to understand that they must, they're required to offer a degree of flexibility for the local context and each country office um, can, ha, has that ability to change and alter slightly um, the processes which they undertake. So um, it, it's, a, it's a, a difficult juggling act, I think, to offer that degree of flexibility, but also to harmonize and standardize at the in the first place. So I don't have an answer to that. It's just a, it's a, it's, you know, I, I want to make sure that everyone's aware of the dilemma that is, that is faced um, by, by OCHA and other donors. Thank you so much, Ben. Over to you, Fernando. Do you have thoughts you would like to say uh, in terms of uh, supporting local national responders, capacity strengthening, and streamlining the global guidelines? Right. I will begin, actually, by the last question to follow on what Ben was just saying. Uh, indeed, I think uh, we have the guidelines as the minimum standard, so the flexibility is there, but at least we have to follow what in the guidelines are right now, the global guidelines as the minimum. Um, and it is indeed a very difficult balance we have to to find here. Um, but part of this uh, simplification and harmonization agreements, uh, just to let you know, like, and, and you might have been had heard if you participated in the previous uh, webinar where WFP and UNHCR presented, where they also talked about their simplification and harmonization process that they have begun. And we are also trying to, to get into that process as well and try to work together with these three agencies, including also UNICEF, and see how we can really uh, move forward in that. That's a start because then, of course, then we will have to look into broader issues. But And this also relates to the issue of reducing donor conditions. And that's a discussion that, yes, we will have to also embark as part of the commitments they made in the through the grand bargain and one of the mechanisms we have to engage very closely with our donors is through another uh, mechanisms that governance mechanisms that we have which is the pool fund working group which uh, includes uh, all our main donors and also has the participation of uh, some UN agencies and also local and international NGOs representatives are into this group. So it's it's something that we will need to, to look into um, and also uh, see how we can move forward. In terms of the capacity assessments and capacity strengthening, um, yes, we are aware of that and I, I also thank Ben for the examples he has shown. We are trying to be proactive in going out to reach out to more local NGOs and to try to provide as much as possible, where depending, of course, of the office and the context we have, where we do have uh, more dedicated staff to do this kind of additional capacity strengthening or building whenever possible, because it is our interest to really get as much as possible uh, applications from local NGOs. It is 
one of our commitments and, and we will we hope that we can really increase that percentage of the amount of allocation that we have so far as i was mentioning during the presentation right now we're at 18 percent of the the funds that we have allocated have been given directly to the national ngos um, we strive to give to the best uh, uh, the, the the best position partner on the ground to to provide the funds. So one one of the one very important concern is exactly to how how we move forward on this capacity strengthening. Uh, some of the ways we have presented is examples like in in Afghanistan this twinning program that Akbar was conducting. Or also shadow shadowing staff probably to staff, but it's something we are also looking. We are aware we have dedicated some resources this past year and, and also last year to try to go more into providing this support, and and we have also raised this issue with donors, like the importance really of getting funding for this specific uh, concern that's there, and that's one of the ways that how we can really comply with the grand bargain commitments of increasing access to local NGOs. I think that uh, was a great response. Thank you so much. Um, we are now coming to the end of our session, so um, I will, as promised, uh, ask each of our speakers, so first Fernando, then Deepak, then Ben, um, to uh, we'll go around the virtual room. If you have any closing thoughts uh, that you would like to leave with us, uh, please do. Fernando, first, over to you. Thank you, Harak. So I'll just leave us key takeaways from this session uh, for, for especially for, for, for those who are not so familiar with country-based pool funds that these are multi-donor funds established by the emergency relief coordinator and that op they operate under the stewardship of humanitarian coordinators on the ground to provide a timely flexible coordinated and principled funding to responses to humanitarian crisis and also that the CPBF funding is prioritized and directly allocated to the best position partners on the ground through transparent and inclusive consultation processes, which thereby supports the coordinated delivery of the humanitarian response plans. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and thanks so much for being with us. And over to you, Deepak. Thanks, thanks Melissa. Just to quickly say <clears throat> thank you to Iqbar and PHAP um, for organizing this excellent learning stream on humanitarian financing and for inviting the Start Fund to this webinar um, for, and of course to the participants for the excellent questions and comments um, and for anyone who would like um, to learn more about how the Start Fund responds to fast and early um, responses to humanitarian emergencies, please do um, get in touch um, on how you can be part of it, um, as well as um, the other initiatives um, of the Start Fund and the Start Network more widely. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, incredibly helpful, and uh, thank you for, for being with us as well. And uh, now to you, Ben. Yeah, um, thanks, PHAP and ICFA, for this opportunity. Um, my closing thoughts, really, are two things. Um, firstly, uh, country-based pool funds um, are getting better, um, but we're seeking your involvement in global processes that will help them improve. So. Um, why don't you join the country-based pool fund NGO dialogue platform? I've put the email address in the uh, in the chat box again. Um, and uh, if you do seek to uh, include yourself, uh, read through the guidelines. Um, so two things that I already put in my presentation, but read through the guidelines and join the NGO dialogue platform. That would be my recommendations to you all. Excellent. Very concrete. Thanks so much, Ben. And um, thanks once again to all of our speakers. A few uh, closing notes then. Um, uh, go through a few items here. First of all, uh, we have been recording today's session so that it can be available uh, as an ongoing resource for you. And that recording will be available in the coming days on the event webpage. You see the link right there. I'll also mention that uh, we will be uh, preparing a transcript and translating that so that we can have subtitles uh, for the whole session in both French and Arabic to, um, to increase access further. Um, and we have uh, a number of um, resources from past events. I'll pass the floor over to Melissa to mention a few of those. 
If you follow Ben's advice and you read the global guidelines and you have any time left over for reading, um, you'll notice that ICFA is going to put together a briefing paper on the topic that was discussed today, but we also are pleased to announce that we've completed our reading package and learning package for topic one, the humanitarian financing landscape, realities, and emerging trends for NGOs. This package includes not only the whiteboard explanatory video, it also has audio and video recordings with not only French but also Arabic subtitles a compilation of answers for those questions that we weren't able to respond to in the webinar, a short informative and easy to read briefing paper, and another uh, supporting document showing you where you can access further information. Okay, excellent. And um, I'll also mention uh, another past event for which uh, the recordings and some resources uh, are also available, and that was the session that took place on the 12th of October um, looking at UN humanitarian funding, so that's available to you as well. And now if we turn to look ahead, we have two more events I'd like to announce that are coming up in this series. The next one taking place on the 6th of December, that will be on the subject of bilateral funding, uh, looking at trends, challenges, and opportunities for NGOs. We hope you'll consider joining us for that. You can already register for the event by clicking uh, right there on your screen. Then. Um, Already moving into 2017, unbelievable. The 27th of January, we have uh, uh, another session looking at the topic of private funding. Um, so uh, seen as potentially a, a growing source, becoming a more and more significant source of funding for humanitarian NGOs. So we'll be exploring that topic on the 27th of January. Again, registrations are already open, um, so feel free to, to register for that. And, and do also, um, of course, feel free to share in your own networks uh, um, if you believe there are, there are others, uh, other peers who, who may be interested um, in joining the discussion um, on these topics. Um, so with that, we will bring things to a close. Um, I'd like to uh, very much thank the whole uh, team here, both uh, at PHAP uh, and at ICFA. So thanks so much uh, for all of your work, Liz Arnans, Marcus Forsberg at PHAP, uh, also James Shell with ICFA, and uh, my co-host, Melissa Petotti. I'll give you the floor one more time uh, in case you have any closing thoughts you'd like to, to leave with us at this point. Just want to say I'm really grateful to all of those who've contributed with their knowledge and uh, this is an issue that we are going to continue to follow because we're all really grappling with the uh, need to uh, provide principled and resourced humanitarian action. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. And last uh, but not least, thanks to our guest speakers today and also to our participants. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, really inspiring to see so many um, of you here and with really, um, really practical uh, problems and also suggestions for each other. So great to see uh, also some of that uh, networking and exchange taking place in the chat. Um, so with that, we'll sign off from Geneva um, and look forward to connecting with you again in a few weeks' time. This is and Herod Lang, over and out.